today. Uh, we're going to begin by singing page 328, uh, should be on the screen. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. And let's do that. I'll tell you what let's do. Let's, uh, it's a very short song, so let's play it through one time with you guys. And let us just take in the, uh, the lyrics and the melody, and, uh, and then we'll sing it twice. Okay? 328. Uh. me up. If you read your upper room this morning, that was your thought for the day. The prayer said, thank you, God, for helping us learn from our trials. Give us your peace and joy in the midst of them. Amen. We never know what trials we go through each week, but I'm thankful for people that pray for me when I have them. 
This morning for announcements, Wednesday, our online Bible study will be at 530, and we will meet downstairs at 6 o'clock for regular Bible study. Next Sunday, or the 25th, I'm sorry. Is that next Sunday? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, that's next Sunday. We'll be an online virtual Snively Chapel homecoming service at 3 p.m. There's an online auction for Snively Chapel going on right now. Sandy, can you tell us more about that? Absolutely. So let me just tell you a couple of things. Um, we're going to have, first of all, I'm going to show one of the big items that for some of you donations. Some of you know Paul is a local artist. Um, <coughs> it has been so wonderful to donate. Uh, and while the Beth donated uh, one of these as well. So um, our starting donation is going to be $100. And there's other items too. Libby has generously donated her specialty cakes and specialty mug. So looking forward to you all um, doing that with us. But next Sunday at 3 o'clock p.m., we're going to have gospel singing. We're going to have our old uh, baby rehab band together, social distancing, uh, best we can. We're going to have uh, Ron is going to give us a, just a minute or two of a brief history of Snively. Uh, for our online, since people, a lot of people away from here never really got to see it, it's actually going to be pretty cool. I'm going to walk around the grounds and the actual building and let them see, you know, see it in live and in person. So, hope you all can join us. We hope we have a signal. Oh, and we also have a, <laughs> yes, we also will have a Facebook uh, donation there if anybody wants to do donations. Of course, it's our annual fundraiser, so we would appreciate the support. Keep the preservation going. All right, that's it. This morning we have a special congratulations to our pastor who was promoted to director of chaplain services at Pikeville Medical Center. We're so proud of him and we're thankful for the good work he's doing at the hospital. So let's give him a round of applause. I didn't tell him to say that. Either. He didn't. <laughs> this morning for prayer requests we want to continue to remember Cooper Coleman and his treatments for his cancer. Ann Sydney Parrish and her treatments for her cancer. Cassie Anderson's family as she lost her mother yesterday. Continue to remember Deb Newsom, Jeff McKinney, we miss you Jeff. Matt White, Cassandra Warwicks is the daughter of Hazel. She came to Sunday school and got a phone call that Cassandra was sick and she had to leave. Remember our schools, our students and teachers as in Pike County we're going back to virtual learning. Bill Murphy and his treatments, continued therapy for Amy Walker Skull, Shull, Skull, I don't know how to say, Skull. Is there any other spoken prayer requests? If not, we'll ask our pastor to come lead us in prayer. Well, we do want to pray for our teachers. Uh, as has been mentioned before, the uh, Beth is one of those uh, in our church that is trying she at this while she's trying to teach both online and uh, teach been doing virtual as well as in class uh, but she's also has a full load with her uh, master's work that she's working on uh, online uh, on top of that and those of us that have done that know the job of having been a full-time mom wife uh, having a full-time job, all those things, uh, the stress that that has. So we want to pray for her and all the teachers today and those that are struggling. We continue to pray for and end uh, to this pandemic. Uh, it's really affected everything and pretty much everyone uh, today. Uh, no one is exempt, Republican or Democrat, rich or poor, black or white. Uh, so we want to pray for them. Any unspoken requests, but lift your hand. God sees your hands and knows what it represents. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, today we do thank you for your presence with us, and we want to thank you, God, that in the midst of election year in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of all the things that we face personally, that we know that you're with us. 
God, that you're very concerned about us. And God, I want to lift these prayer requests up to you today and ask you to help. And we pray for everyone out there who might uh, listen to our service or watch our service on Facebook or YouTube. God, we know there's several hundred people each week that are listening in. So sometimes, Lord, we, we may see empty seats. But there are people out there, Father, who are a part of this service. And we thank you for that. And we pray for them. And we pray, God, for an end to this pandemic. We do pray for a vaccine that will be soon. And we've been told that it is soon. We pray, God, for the leaders of our country, our president, and all those, God, who make decisions that affect us all. And, God, we do pray for the upcoming election. And we pray, God, that you would lead us and guide us that we might vote for the person that, uh, God, that you lead us and that we feel the best person. And at the same time, God, that we would respect those that we oppose. Help us, Lord, to, to learn to love one another. And sometimes, Lord, we just need to put our differences aside and just love and, and to, to learn to, uh, to, to figure a way through the division. And so, Lord, we pray today as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespass as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All right. Uh, we're going to uh, stand and sing our doxology. We want to thank you for giving and for those of you that continue to be faithful in that. Thank you so much. We think about the different ministries of our church and all that we, we do as a little church. We just uh, got a letter from uh, the children's home. And I think the donation that we gave for the fifth Sunday was like five. $565. So thank you for that generous and wonderful donation from such a small church. Uh, we, uh, we're very grateful. Let's stand and sing. the offering. Brother Richie, would you pray? Dear God, we come to you again this morning. We do want to thank you for this day. We want to thank you for looking down on us and giving us a desire to be back in your house. God, if we go through this again, we pray that you would bless us and give us the strength and the wisdom to handle the situation that we're in. We pray that you would bless the people that are listening to you for what we have. Thank you for what you give us each day of life. And I want to thank you, dear God, for the love that we have in our hearts that we can share with this church and share with others and the offerings that we give. <coughs> God, I do pray that when we accept this offering, we accept it in your name, and this, and this church sends out in the ministries that we support. I just pray your blessings will be upon all of them, and that they can go for a good cause and use for what, be used for what we give for. God, I would ask now that you bless the service today, and bless what you said, that your word would be taught, and we can grow from what will be presented to us today. In there, God bless us in this service in my prayer. Amen. Amen. So uh, this song, as I was preparing for the sermon and reading, was a song that came up, uh, came to mind, and uh, called uh, Give Me Jesus. And that should be our heart's desire and prayer today. In the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, 
In the morning when I rise, give me Jesus, give me Jesus, give me Jesus, you can have all the truth, give me taken from Exodus chapter 33, beginning with verse 12. Moses said to the Lord, See, you have said to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now if I have found favor in your sight, Show me your ways, so that I may know you, and find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. He said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, If your presence will not go, do not carry us from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people, unless you go with us? In this way, we shall be distinct, I and your people, from every people on the face of the earth. The Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing that you have asked, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, Show me your glory, I pray. And he said, I will make my, all my goodness pass before you, and will proclaim before you the name the Lord, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, You cannot see my face, for no one shall see me and live. And the Lord continued, See, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but not my face shall not be seen. Let's pray. Our Father, we pray that we might be the face of Christ. We pray that the word that would be open to us by our pastor would show us how to do that, not only in our community of faith, but in our community at large. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Ron. And uh, we want to continue to pray for everyone that you know. Uh, I know Sarah and David have 
have chosen uh, for a while um, to to not attend services because of their concern for catching the COVID-19 and uh, they said they'll be probably listening, watching online. And uh, so we want to pray for them and, and for others that uh, have those concerns because as you know, uh, there are people that are more vulnerable than others. It's more of a concern and uh, we want to pray about that. I know it's kind of a leap today as we uh, think about uh, last Sunday we were in uh, Philippians and we are jumping all the way back to the book of Exodus this week and that's quite a leap uh, but we'll still we're still continuing our thought on the pressing on series and so I think you'll find that in this passage that that theme does resonate with Moses and with this uh, passage. It really does come through. Um, what we have here in this passage is a leader on the edge, really. Moses has come to the place where God has asked him to do things that he doesn't really understand. And, you know, Moses and God had a pretty good connection, and Moses just tells God what he feels. He doesn't hold anything back. And Moses is basically saying, God, you, you've told me you want me to do this. You've told me you want me to take the people from here to there, to the promised land. And we're leaving Sinai for the promised land. You, you've told me to do it, but you haven't really explained to me how you want me to do it. And who's going to help me do it? I don't have a lot of instruction here, and, and it's kind of like, uh, kind of like I felt and others felt. When, you know, when when I graduated from seminary and began pastoring the church, and all the Greek and the Hebrew that I learned, and all the stuff that I learned in class didn't really apply to all the practical stuff in churches. When it came to church politics and and people that were hurting and people that were dying and some of that stuff was great in the classroom and I kept I kept waiting to be able to to apply that but for the most part a lot of it was things that helped me in my sermons but it wasn't something that really helped me in direction for being a pastor and so as a leader sometimes we get a little discouraged and we get a little uh, on the edge sometimes and we think you know I, I, I don't know God you, you told me this you want me to do this but but I don't know if I'm adequate enough to do this and we get we get discouraged it happens more than we think maybe more than we will even re willing to admit that you know one of the things that I, I have learned as, as a pastor is that you can't you can't please everybody it's just not something you can do and, and so you know I can I can preach a sermon and and one person will come up and say they love that that series and another person said they didn't really care for it so you really can't please everybody I've learned that a long time ago but at the same time you still want to be able to be effective in, in your ministry and then there are those times where you just feel like you're very inadequate for the task that God has given you to do pretty much every Sunday morning. <laughs> you know, like, man, what do I do with this? You know, and, and, uh, and sometimes you just like, kind of like Moses. Lord, uh, I, I know that, you know, Moses says basically, you've told me you know me by name and, and, and you seem to like me. <laughs> You know, but I need more. I need more than that. I, I need some, there's some, something that I need from you that I don't feel like I'm getting. So, as I look at this passage, there are basically three things that Moses wants from God. And three things that you and I want from God. They're really the same thing. And the first thing is this. Moses is asking and wanting an understanding of God's purpose. He really wants to know, God, what's this all about? What's this all about? Look at verse 
12 in chapter 33, if you're following along. If not, I'll read it to you. Uh, chapter 33, verse 12, Moses said to the Lord, See, you have said to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and also found favor in my sight. Now, if I found favor in your sight, show me your ways, so that I may know you and find favor in your sight. Show me your ways, God. Give me an understanding of what's going on. What is the purpose behind this? And what are the plans that you have? Where are we going and why? And you know, sometimes we get to that place in life and, and we think, you know, if I could just understand why this is happening to me, then I would be able to press on. God doesn't always reveal that, does He? God doesn't always give us a play-by-play -play action and a detailed plan like some of us want. Some of us are very detail-oriented, and we go into life, and if we work in a job or whatever, we want a plan. We want to know what's expected of me. I want a job description, and this is what I expect, and this is what you expect. But sometimes God's plans and God's purposes are not so detailed. They're a little more vague. God will say to us, I want you to do this, or I want you to do that. I want you to go. But He doesn't tell us where we're going. Or He wants you to go, and He doesn't tell you why, or how He's going to help you do this. Sometimes that's frustrating. Because we are wired to know what. And you know, we, from a child, we, we grow up, and our parents ask us to do something. And we say, but why? And the parents will say, because I told you. And sometimes we are like that with God, and God will say, I want you to do this. And we'll say, but why, God? And God says, because I told you so. I want you to trust me. But boy, that's hard sometimes. We're just not wired that way. But we want to at least know that God has a purpose in what we're doing, that it's not just something that uh, <clears throat> makes no sense. And sometimes it doesn't make sense to us. And sometimes the plan of God, as it begins to unfold, may start to make sense. But sometimes it takes a while. It may take years for us to look back in the past and say, oh, wait a minute. I see now. I see what you were doing. I understand a little bit about that. That even the past, the times when I veered off the path, God, you used that too. And you had a purpose. And you had a plan. It's sort of like looking at... You know, a pattern from the wrong side. It doesn't make sense. Or a puzzle that isn't put together. And finally it begins to take shape. And begins to make sense. And you begin to, and, it, and for some of us, that may not even happen until we get to glory. We may not understand the, the, why things happen. And the mysteries of, of God may stay mysteries to us until we get to heaven. But sometimes God does reveal at least a few things to us, and we, understand, we begin to understand. But even in this situation, God doesn't explain everything to Moses. But another thing that Moses is wanting is, besides an understanding of God's purpose, is he wants an awareness of God's presence. And I think more than anything else, this is what we need. Just an awareness of God's presence. You know, God has told us, I'll never leave you, and we understand that. But sometimes we just need to be reminded of that or to be made aware of that. In verse 14, he says, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. So God's telling him, I'm going to give you my presence. And he said to him, If your presence will not go, Moses says, then don't carry us up from here. For how shall it be known that I found favor in your sight, I and your people, unless you go with us? And I don't want to go if you're not with me. In this way we shall be distinct, I and your people, from every people on the face of the earth. And then a couple times it's mentioned in this place where God says to Moses, I know your name. And Moses says, yes, you know my name. And the idea there, I think, behind all this is what we're really seeking is for the presence of God to be in our life and the, an intimate acquaintance. You know, the fact that you know my name says something. 
You know, have you ever been, uh, you pass somebody on the street or maybe in the hallway or somewhere, it happens all the time, and somebody will come up and start talking to you, and you know you're supposed to know them, you know you should know their name, and you're like, I can't remember their name. And I'm probably one of the worst at that, and you're like, you, you may try it, and you may call them the wrong name, and that's very embarrassing. Or you might say, act like you know it and don't even ask. Thankfully at the hospital we have name tags. That's very helpful, for, for at least for the employees. But sometimes you may just say, I'm sorry. I can't remember your name. Just be honest about it. But there's something special about knowing our names and be able to say the name. It means that I know you enough, I care about you enough to be able to say your names. And, and I'm working on this. I'm, I, I have a, you know, a hard time sometimes. But uh, Dale Carnegie one, one time said, the sweetest sound in any language is the sound of hearing our name. Because we want people to know. And it comes, it's the same thing is true with God. It reminds me of a story that I read. It was about the time back in the 70s. Uh, this was after the, uh, the hippie movement had kind of faded into the, uh, you know, into oblivion. Well, it, it kind of did in the sunset of, of California. The, the hippies of the 60s kind of grew up. And they had to get real jobs, you know. And many of them uh, moved uh, from the Haight-Ashbury uh, place out to Santa Cruz, California, where rent was cheaper. And they all had children by now. And the thing about their children, this was, and some of you uh, educators may appreciate this, the children's, uh, some of their names were a little out there, you know. Uh, now, you know, there were plenty of Michaels and you know, Lisa and Charles and all that. But many of them named their kids some names that were hard to say and sometimes just a little out there. Like Sunbeam or uh, Flower or Meadow or something like that. And uh, for the kids in kindergarten, this was uh, for the teachers a, a difficult time. One particular teacher talked about a child that came in there. They had their name tags. And uh, his name was Fruit Stand. He had his, on his thing, Fruit Stand. And she thought, well, that's a terrible th name to name a child, Fruit Stand, you know? And so she said, well, I'm, not, I'm just going to make the best of it. And so all day long she just said, okay, Fruit Stand, would you want your pencil sharpened? Fruit Stand, would you like a glass of milk? Fruit Stand and all day long. And he just looked at her, never said anything, never seemed to get very close to her. But this went on all day long until finally the end of the day she asked him, uh, what's the name of your bus stop? And uh, all the kids had uh, on the name tag, the, the, the parents had been asked to write the name of the bus stop on the reverse side of their name tag. And all of a sudden she's, he doesn't say anything to her. And she said, what's the name of your bus stop, Fruit Stan? He doesn't say anything. So he, she walks over and flips the name tag around and it says the word Anthony. As you might imagine, it was backwards. I don't know. Fruit stand may be a, a name that you would name a child, but I wouldn't think so. But the, the idea there is that, you know, God knows you and I by name. You know, Jesus talks about the hair of her head, the number, the whole idea there that God has an intimate acquaintance with you. And we think about all the billions of people in the world and the billions of people that ever lived and we understand that God knows you. He knows everything about you. He knows you by name. He knows you intimately. He has a relationship with you even before you were even born. Well, that's pretty deep there. Think about presence. That God knows us. That we're known by our name. That to us and to God, we're not just a number. We're not just a person that God thinks, well, those people. But He knows us by name. No, you know, Moses had a, a, an awareness of God's presence. And he wanted that in his life. And we all want that. You know, uh, Richard Rohr says, i got a quote here that's, he's one of my favorite writers. And, you know, I'm uh, sometimes when I'm reading his books, I want to write down 
all the nuggets that he has. And sometimes I just about have to write the whole book down. But anyway, he says this about presence. We cannot attain the presence of God. Let me back up. We cannot attain the presence of God because we're already in the presence of God. What's absent is awareness. Little do we realize that God's love is maintaining us in existence with every breath we take. As we take another, it means that God is choosing us now and now and now and now. Wow. So yes, God's presence is with us, and what we really need is an awareness of that. We want to feel that presence. We want to know that presence. And that's why sometimes, like the other day, I was called to the uh, pre-op where a lady was about to have surgery. And they called me to come and pray with her, and she had requested the chaplain. I thought maybe it was somebody I knew, but when I got there, I didn't know her, and she didn't know me. But she wanted me to pray before her surgery because I think she wanted to know and feel and be aware of that presence of God during that time. There's something about that. You know, that's why David said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Because when we know God is with us, we can press on. We can go on. We're known by His, He knows our name, and He's with us. And so we have an understanding of God's purpose and an awareness of God's presence. But finally, we also have an experience, and Moses wanted an experience of God's power. He wanted an experience of God's power. Verse 17 and 18, Moses basically it says, God, I need more. <laughs> he, keeps, he keeps saying, God, I know you're with me. I, I, I know that you're, you're there and, and I appreciate that, but I need more. God said, okay, what do you want? I want to, I want to experience your glory. I want to see you. You know, I, we've, been, we've been kind of hanging out and that's great. And I, I've we, we've been great buddies and all that, but I want to see you. And I want to see your glory. And God says, okay, here's what I'll do. I'm going to grant that. I'm going to put you on a rock in the cleft of the rock, and you are going to be standing there. But I'm going to hide. I'm going to take my hand and cover your eyes because you can't see my face or you won't be able to live. You can't, un you can't survive the glory of God in your natural body. But I'll let, allow you to see a glimpse of my glory. As I pass by, you'll see my back and you'll see the glory of God. And God did that for Moses. He did that very thing. And I think beyond the fact that we want to feel the presence of God and to know the purpose of God, we want to experience the power of God. And there's all kinds of ways that people try to experience the power of God. I just finished reading a book, uh, Salvation on Sand Mountain. It's about the snake handlers in Kentucky and Virginia, West Virginia. And uh, they take that verse uh, in, in Mark literally about they shall take up serpents. And one of the things I think that they're really wanting, they're wanting to seek the power of God. I think they do it in a bad way, but we all want that. Some of my Pentecostal brothers and sisters and charismatic brothers and sisters, that's what they're really wanting. And we all want that. We want to experience the power of God, to know that God's power is going to give us what we need for the journey ahead, whatever your journey may be. Sometimes the task may be greater than you can even accomplish on your own. And you want to know God is with you, but you also want the power Jesus told the disciples, go out and I'll go with you and I will give you power to be witnesses of mine in all the earth. That's what the day of Pentecost was all about. The church gathered together and came together in unified form and the power of God failed. And they were able to go and do what they needed to do. Peter stood up and preached and thousands were saved. Maybe that's what we need today. Maybe that's what's missing in our lives today is that Pentecost power. 
that we need. I don't know why it's missing, but I know sometimes it's not there like we once experienced it. But God's power is still real. And sometimes we get a glimpse of that. Sometimes you and I, when we're having a tough time in our life and going through the times of life, or we're at somebody's bedside, we experience just a glimpse of God's glory. Or just as the lady who was uh, taken by the issue of blood said, if I could just but touch the hem of His garment. And sometimes all we need is a touch, just a glimpse, just a momentary uh, picture of God's glory, and that's all we need to get us through, to press on. And so we press on because we feel that power in God in our life. Now that, that power may uh, be expressed in different ways. But what it is evidence of the power is not that we can handle rattlesnakes. But it's that we can take the next step and go through the next valley and that we can witness to other people and live the lives that we need to live. That's how we know we got the power of God in our life. Just to know His purpose, that God has a purpose for your life. To know that His presence is with you always. And that well, God will give you the power that you need to take that next step. How am I going to be able to do it? Somebody says, well, God, God promised He'd never allow life to, be, uh, to put more on me than I can bear. Well, I'm going to tell you, there's been a lot of times I've had trials that were more than I could bear. He didn't promise you you wouldn't have things more than you could bear. But what He promised was that He would give you the power that you need. Paul said, Lord, would you remove this thorn in the flesh? And God said, no. But my grace is sufficient, and I will give you my strength, and I will give you my power, and you will be able to overcome. We can do that today through Christ. I'm going to ask the musicians to come today as we sing. And I just want to say today, whatever it is you're going through, I don't know. But God knows. And God will give you the strength that you need and the power that you need to take that step. And you know, the thing about God is He doesn't give you that grace that you need tomorrow, today. He gives you the grace you need for each moment. And then tomorrow He'll give you the grace you need for tomorrow. So just trust in His goodness today. So we're going to sing, if you would, uh, ask you to stand. And we're going to sing uh, Rock of Ages, number 361. We'll sing all four verses. I think there's four. And again, uh, if you need to come and pray, feel free to do so. Let's sing.
hear the benediction. Go out among the outcasts and the grieving and speak the word of life and hope. And may the God who breathed life into creation be your delight. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, Amen. Amen. Let's sing, sent forth by God's blessing.